Reading to Remember, Wednesday, 12th of July, 2017. A narrative of the battles of Catrabra and Waterloo with the defence of Ugamon by Matthew Clay, formerly of Scots Fusilier Guards and late Sergeant Major of the, of the Bedfordshire Regiment of Light Infantry, commanded by Colonel R.T. Gilpin, MP, 31st October, 1853, edited by Gareth Glover. Matthew Clay was born in the parish of Buildworth near Mansfield in Nottinghamshire in 1795. He was originally trained as a framework knitter, but for some reason, possibly the upheaval which struck the textile industry at this period and encapsulated by the Luddite riots, he volunteered at the age of 18 for the King's Shilling, joining the Third Foot Guards in London on 6th December 1813. His pocket account book, now held by the Bedfordshire and Luton Archive Service, reference Z1081, records that on joining he was 5 foot 7 inches tall, had a fresh complexion with grey eyes and light hair. Probably because of his lack of height, he served in the light company of 2nd Battalion, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Master of in Holland, Bergen op Zoom, and France from 1814 to 1816. He returned home with the battalion and was promoted to corporal on 21st March 1818 and to sergeant on 14th February 1822, becoming the first drill and pay sergeant. He served abroad again during the Carlist Wars when the battalion was sent to Portugal between 2nd of January 1827 and 15th of April 1828. Clay was married to Joanna on 27th of February 1823 at Stoke Dar- Darrell in Devon and had 12 children, of which only three survived infancy. Selina Anne, born in London 18 July, uh, 18th July 1825. Fred- Frederick York, born at Devonport 27th of January 1827. It would appear his wife was left at Devonport with her family to have the baby, Clay having proceeded to Portugal with his battalion some 25 days earlier, and Matthew, born in London on 17th of April, 1833. Clay was fortunate never to be wounded and was eventually discharged from the service at his own request in 1833 when he became Sergeant Major of the Bedfordshire Militia until 1852. Clay finally died at Bedford, on the 5th of June, 1873, aged 78 years, and was given a hero's funeral. A narrative of the battles of Catrabra and Waterloo with the defence of Ugamon. I, being the the in the light company of the 3rd Foot Guards, now Lieutenant General Sir James MacDonald, was with the Coldstream Company under Lieutenant Colonel MacDonald as light infantry of the 2nd Brigade, commanded by Major General Sir John Bing. It was early on the morning of the 16th of June, 1815. We marched from a chateau situated on the environs of the park of Enghein, from whence, having marched some miles, we halted near bren le comte for a considerable time, owing to some arrangements that were being made relative to our future movements, as we supposed among ourselves. We afterwards marched on without knowing anything as to our destination, until we arrived in sight of Nivelle, when we ascended a field on our left, took off our knapsacks, and sent out watering parties, expecting to remain there for the night. We could then hear distinctly the report of cannon fire, the meaning of which we were no longer at a loss to find out. Having now received the order to march with all speed, we proceeded accordingly, leaving our watering parties to join us on our way. We marched through the town before mentioned and were joined by our watering party. The man belonging to my mess, having been fortunate enough to obtain a little table beer for us instead of water, was most gladly received by us. We then marched hastily on, the sound of cannon and musketry becoming more distinct and being nearer at hand. We also met with some wounded. As we approached the field of action, our two light companies led off into the field on the left and the first foot guards entered the wood bossu on the right of the road, where I now leave them and confine myself to the two light companies commanded by Lieutenant Colonel MacDonald as above. We now loaded our muskets 
and very hastily advanced up the rising ground in the open field, the shot from the enemy now whizzing amongst us. We quickly attained the summit, and bringing our left shoulders forward, the enemy retiring before us. We had now arrived near to a building against the walls of which the shots of the guns of the enemy intended for us were freely rebounding. Being just within range of their guns, our skilful commander led us through an enclosed yard where several bodies of the enemy's cavalry lay slain previous to our arrival. Also an adjoining garden a short distance to our right which concealed our advance from the enemy's view and passing singly through a gap in the hedge at the extremity of the garden nearest to the enemy, we immediately formed in the field into which we had entered and were at the same time joined by our light guns, which had been brought round to the outside of the enclosure th- through which we had passed. They immediately opened their fire upon the enemy who hastened their retreat, and we at the same time advancing, after having advanced some, some considerable distance through the rye that was trampled down and passed over numerous bodies of the slain, more particularly near to the fence, enclosing a house and garden, which clearly showed that there was a very severe contest for the possession of it. I particularly noticed a young officer of the 33rd Regiment laying amongst the slain. His bright scarlet coat and silver lace attracted my attention when marching over his headless body. For the most part, English, Brunswickers and Highlanders, more especially the latter... We halted for a short time whilst our brigade of guns, which a little further to the left exchanged shots with the enemy. Lieutenant Colonel Dashwood, being in command of the 3rd Regiment Light Company, took the opportunity of placing himself in front of the same, and we cheerful countenance and manner addressed us, saying, Now, men, let us see what you are made of. We continued pursuing the enemy over the slain, which were thickly spread around us. By this time our commander found it necessary to form us into square to oppose the enemy's cavalry, who were constantly menacing us on our advance, our square being compactly formed and prepared to receive cavalry. Their cavalry now bearing off, the enemy's artillery would alternatively annoy us with their shells, which were skilfully directed, but were equally skilfully avoided through the tact of our commander." Our movements now for a time were performed whilst in square, for the reason above stated, being drawn compactly together, the officers being in the centre. I had frequent opportunities observing the keen watchfulness of our commander. He, being mounted on his charger, could undoubtedly, from his elevated position, distinctly see the preparation of the enemy and the renewal of attack on us by the united force of the infantry, cavalry and artillery, Being foiled by the timely movements of our square, ever obedient to the commander, we escaped the destructive efforts of the well-directed shells of the enemy who, no doubt having observed our repeated escapes from the galling fire of their artillery, their cavalry now menaced us more daringly and prevented our taking fresh ground until their artillery had thrown their shells amongst us. By this means we had a more narrow escape than before, being compelled to remain longer in our position to resist cavalry. I, being one of the outward rank of the square, can testify as to the correct aim of the enemy, whose shells, having fallen to the ground and exploded within a few paces of the rank in which I was kneeling, a position of their destructive fragments in their ascent passing between my head and that of my comrade next in the rank, its force and tremendous sound causing an unconscious movement of the head not to be forgotten in haste. The evening was now approaching, and with loud cheers we drove the enemy before us, who now took up their position for the night on rising ground adjoining the wood. The firing gradually ceased, and their campfires were quickly lighted. We were then extended in line and lay down on our arms amongst the trampled corn. All being quiet and diligently watching during the night, the only sounds we heard arose from the suffering wounded in their different languages, who lay as they had fallen some in the adjoining wood, others distant and others nearer to us. In different parts of the plain or cornfield where we were posted, the deep and heavy groans of the more faint and expiring, with the loud calls for water and others less exhausted, whilst many hundreds of slain lay on every side and a very formidable and watchful enemy before us. But this is only a very faint picture of the night of the 16th of June, 1815, we passed on to the plains of Catra Bra. 
Being now settled in our position for the night, and there being numbers of wounded men laying close around my post begging for water and assistance, my comrade with myself, being on duty, were also suffering severely from thirst. He, being the older soldier of the two, proposed to keep watch whilst I attended to the wounded, and I went in dark in search of water, having groped my way about among the sufferers and placed them in as easy a position as I could, many having fallen in very uneasy postures and being altogether helpless, increased their suffering, some having fallen with their legs doubled under them, others with the weight of the dead upon them and the like, having afforded them all the ease that lay in my power. And all being quiet around us and taking a camp kettle from off the knapsack of a dead man, Wended, winded my way a short distance to the rear of our posts where I had observed the appearance of water when advancing after the enemy on the afternoon previous and finding a narrow channel of water in a ditch which I traced into the wood from where our brave comrades of the first guards had driven the enemy in the evening. There was a pond from which I filled my kettle and drank freely from its contents. Enjoying it much, whilst in the dark, I found my way back to my post, where my comrade and the poor sufferers from wounds gladly partook of the contents of the same. I believe it was after this that some slight movements among the troops in our line caused the enemy to commence a fire of musketry in the dark, and it was reported that several of our men were wounded by them. There was one man of my company who I did not see after. All being again quiet, just after the dawn of the morning, my comrade wished me to go again for water, which I did. On my arriving at the pond, the light of day just enabled me to see that in and around lay the bodies of those who had fallen in the combat on the evening previous, and the liquid we had partaken in of was dyed with their blood, for I saw, saw the remainder. I do not remember whether I returned with a further supply, although I am aware that I lost all my relish for any more of it. Having hastened back to my post, being just in time to fall in and stand in column as the light disclosed us to the, enemy, the view of the enemy. From our position in column, we proceeded to our different posts, keeping as much as possible concealed from the enemy and hanging, having a watchful eye upon them. We were prepared to oppose their advance. The enemy not being disposed to disturb us except by a few straggling shots from their skirmishers, which were mostly brought upon us by some of our German allies, who appeared desirous to be at them. We took up a position within a loose sort of hedge dividing the wood from the rye field, which we had previously occupied, and where the contest had been most severe. The spot where we were posted was in a hollow track within the wood, we lay on the rising bank covered by the loose fence. This, I presume, is the place where the Grenadier Guards met with such a severe reception from the enemy when in pursuit of them from the wood. On entering the cornfield on the slope from the field to the hollow track within the wood, the dead bodies of the same regiment were lying very thick on the ground. All the wounded that were found were collected together and with the blankets of the dead made into a sort of bed under the shade of the trees in the wood, in the hope of their being safely taken to the hospital. But, unfortunately, at a later hour of the day, we were suddenly withdrawn from our position without being able to render any further assistance to them. We found our way through the wood, and having entered the close or, or, or field on the opposite side from the plain or cornfield which we were marching across, when suddenly a need to come Read up, rode up to the commanding officer and apprised him that we were approaching the enemy's lines, they being concealed behind a distant hedge. We immediately brought our left shoulders forward and stepped off in double quick time until we reached the woods side and continued to move on quickly until we were more concealed from the enemy. We shortly entered a narrow and rather deep lane where we met a party of English light dragoons under the charge of a sergeant going to fetch the wounded from where I have before described. We now proceeded along a footpath across a field, the situation being higher than the lane, 
and from whence we could distinguish at a distance to our right a body of English cavalry dismounted standing by their horses. We had arrived at a brook which crossed our path, and being extremely thirsty, from the moment a monk forgot the danger we were in and drank most eagerly from it. Being a little refreshed, we passed on until we had overtaken some of returning troops when we halted for a short time by the roadside near Gainap. We then proceeded until near the plains of Waterloo. We then passed along a path through some fields to our left where we again halted for a short time. A heavy thunderstorm came on and the enemy being ground, having green ground on us, we marched on until we reached the summit of an eminence in the clover field before us. There we halted and took off our knapsacks. The storm still continuing with dreadful violence and we thinking of remaining there for the night, we ordered to pitch our blankets, they having been prepared for such purpose. Having six buttonholes with loops of small cords and lined with pieces of duck at each corner and also on each side of the centre. The company having been previously told off in fours, cast lots to see which two of them should unpack their knapsacks and pitch the blankets. Myself being one of the unlucky two, we fixed our muskets perpendicular at each end of the blanket, passing the knob of the ramrods through the two buttonholes at the corresponding corner of each blanket, then slipping the loop of the cord round the muzzle of both muskets, keeping them upright at the full stretch of the blanket, and peg down the bracing cords at the opposite ends, whilst the other two men, first at one end and then at the other, and tightened and pegged down the lower corners of the blankets. The upper edges being kept close, all four creeping under the cover, taking the remainder of our equipment. The storm, still continuing with equal force, our covering became more speedily soaked with wet, and by this time the shots of the enemy's artillery began to fall among us. Our guns, being in position on the rising ground nearby us, opened up on the enemy, but immediately called upon to assemble, and those whose knapsacks were already packed instantly fell into the ranks and hastened down to a large orchard belonging to the Chateau of Hugomon, leaving us wet blanket men to strike, pack up and follow them, which we found to be no easy matter. The blankets being exceedingly wet and the buff straps of the knapsacks being very slippery were, when upon open to a heavier storm, very difficult to pack and slip on the shoulders the straps being quite or nearly useless. Having eventually succeeded in putting on the knapsack, I hastened after my comrades. Although unacquainted with the way, they had proceeded to the orchard, where I perceived that artillery were keeping up a brisk fire. I descended the hill, a short distance below, and stooping, ran under the range of their shots until I passed to their front, where on arriving at the opening in the fence, on the inside of which was a deep ditch, and the ground being wet, I could distinguish that my company had gone that way, and making a spring to leap the ditch. The ground being slimy and increased my weight of my wet blanket caused me to slip into the same, which being neck deep, I found very difficult to, in getting out, which having succeeded in accomplishing, I quickly joined my company, who were extended along the upper side of the orchard in a shallow ditch, sheltered by a high, bushy hedgerow which separated us from the enemy, who were close at hand. The weather still, continuing very stormy, had become very cold, from which we suffered much during the night as we remained in our position. And without food, we, having been deprived of our rations, we should not arrive early enough to be distributed amongst us. At the time of the sudden retreat from the wood, we were kept continually on the alert, being frequently visited by a field officer, Wall Sultan. During the darkness of the night, and who invariably asked some questions, and received answers from one or other as he rode past in the rear of our line. Within the hedgerow, enclosing the orchard, when daylight appeared, all being quiet on a Sunday morning, we procured some fuel from the farm of Hugamont, then lighted fires and warmed ourselves, our limbs very much cramped, sitting on the side of the wet ditch the whole night. The sergeant of each section gave a small piece of bread, about an ounce, to each man. Inquired, inquiry was made along the ranks for a butcher. One having gone forward, he was immediately ordered to kill a pig. There had been cattle above named farmhouse which having been sorted was divided amongst the company, a portion of the head in its rough state being my share, and having placed it upon the fire, the heat of which served to dry our clothing and accrements, and to cook our separate portion of meat, which having become warm through and blackened the smoke, I partook of a little, found it too raw and unsavoury, having neither bread or salt, I put the remainder in my haversack, and taking my musket to put in order for action, 
which having been loaded the day previously, and, not, and I mean not distilled during the night, I discharged its contents at an object with a ball embedded in the bank where I had purposely placed it as a target. While so employed, we kept a sharp look on, out on the enemy, who were no doubt similarly employed, while at the same time having well attended to those things usual for a soldier to do, in the presence of the enemy. When not actively engaged, e.g. examine the amount of the state of ammunition remain, remain after the previous engagements, also put in his musket and fighting trim, well flinted, oiled. By the by, the flint musket then in use was a sad bore on the occasion from the effects of the wet. The springs of the locks became wood-bound and would not act correctly when in action. The clumsy flint became also useless. The shortest way of amending these failures, which was very disheartening, was to make an exchange from those that were in amongst the slain. Being a Sunday morning and well soaked from rain the previous night, I took my, from my haversack a change of linen, which came to hand on the passing of the dead bodies of some of our German allies who had fallen. The linen, having been evidently wet from the wash, was homemade. Being now prepared for the day's encounter, I went to the farmyard of Huggermount for straw to sit upon, the ground being very wet. I entered the gates facing the wood into the farmyard, and on my left was a building in which a quantity of dry straw. It being yet early in the morning, some of the troops were yet taking rest on the, on the moat. The whole of the west side of the farmyard appeared to be composed of buildings suitable for farming purposes, such as a well of water, sheds for wagons, and etc. And the whole present solid wall on the exterior mostly looped hold. Having obtained what I thought would be useful in the use, useful to us in the orchard, I returned and found my comrades ready to receive a share of what I brought to them. Imagine that we should have to contend with the enemy on our present ground and employed ourselves, the hedge being thick, and clearing away branches on the side and making clear openings through, by which means, without exposing ourselves, we could take a more correct aim at the enemy. While thus employed, we were quietly instructed to, to face to our right and march in the direction of Huggerman, known to us as a farmhouse. Passing the gates and... Round the upper corner of the building, our company led into a long and narrow kitchen garden, which was extended under the cover of a close hedge to the cornfield, through which the skirmishers of the enemy were advancing to attack. We remained in a kneeling position under the cover, but annoyed by a most galing fire from our opponent's guns to our left, our position so near to us. Indeed, that spreading of their small shots rarely escaped the contact with our knapsacks, our accrements, even the heels of our shoes while kneeling, were struck by them. We remained in this position for a considerable time, and, now, and the enemy now advancing in great force to attack the chateau. A commanding officer on his charge remained on the road between the fence of the garden and the exterior of the wall of the farm to our rear. It was being a high position from whence he could more perfectly watch the movements of the enemy. <coughs> the expected signal was given for us to retire from the garden. The front company, which was led by Lieutenant Colonel Dashwood, Captain Evelyn and Arrington into the wood. I had been in the rear subdivision on the quitting in the garden and re- reaching the road as above Lieutenant Standon with a very determined appearance. Having his cap in one hand and a sword in the other, called our attention to join him and charge the enemy. We went up the road towards the wood. The enemy's skirmishers had been under cover about, about the hedge. On the right of the wood, our party took advantage of cover. Myself and, man, myself and a man named Ar Gan, having taken our position under cover a circle built stack from whence we fired on the enemy. Being earnestly engaged, the intervening objects were the cause of our not perceiving the movements and retreat of our comrades, now left to ourselves as we imagined, by not seeing anyone near us, and the enemy skirmish remained under cover, consciously firing at us. We likewise kept firing and retiring down the road at which we had advanced. We now halted, our own wisely ascended the height part of a sloping ground on which the exterior wall of the farm was built. Thinking of singling out the enemy skirmishers more correctly, I fairly quickly found that I became a target for them my red coat being more distinctly visible than theirs. Remaining in position, I continued to exchange shots for the enemy across the kitchen garden. They have an advantage of the fence, as covering their shots freely struck the wall in my rear. Our company from which we were separated had now opened fire within, from within. My musket was proving defective, was very discour- discouraging, but casting my eye on the ground, I saw a musket, which I immediately took possession of in exchange for my old one. The new musket was worn from recent use and proved an excellent one, it having bonged to the light entry of the foot, first foot guards. My comrades during this time had more wisely contended with the enemy on a low ground by the garden fence. He had been my senior by some years, and a very steady and undaunted old soldier. Although I was but a youth, I felt as though I had partaken of his courageous spirit. 
Being still annoyed by the shots of the enemy who were under good cover, we took advantage of the cover stack some distance off, and beyond the lower extremity of the farming premises from where, whence we exchanged several shots. My comrade now from his position by the stack appraised me of the enemy's advance to renew the attack, and supposing ourselves shut out from the farm, we were for a moment or two quite a loss of how to act, but on turning my eyes towards the lower gate, I saw they were open, and at the same time appraising my comrade of so favourable an opportunity, we hastened towards that way. And before I entered the farm, I saw several of the wounded of our company making the rear, for the rear. Amongst them, I distinguished Lieutenant Colonel Dashwood, Captain Eveline of the same company, who were also wounded. On entering the courtyard, I saw the doors, of, or rather gates, were riddled with shot holes. It was also very wet and dirty. Its entrance lay many dead bodies of the enemy. One I particularly noticed, was, which appeared to have the, been a French officer, but more scarily distinguishable, being to all appearance as though they had been very much trodden upon and covered with mud and gained in the interior. I saw Lieutenant Colonel MacDonald carrying a large piece of wood or trunk of a tree in his arms. One of his cheeks marked with blood, his charger lay bleeding over a short distance, with which he was hastening to secure the gates against a renewed attack of the enemy, which most vigorously repulsed. I, being now told off with the others under Lieutenant Goff of the Coldstream Guards, was posted in the upper room of the chateau, it being situated higher than the surrounding buildings. We annoyed the enemy skirmishes from the window, which the enemy observing threw their shells amongst us and set the building on fire we were defending. Our officer placing himself at the entrance of the apartment would not permit any one of us to quit his post until our position became hopeless and too perilous to remain. Fully expecting the floor to sink with us every moment, and in our escape, several of us were more or less injured. The enemy's artillery, having forced the upper gates, a party the, of them rushed in, who were as quickly driven back, no one being left inside but a drummer boy without his drum, whom I lodged in the stable or outhouse. Many of the wounded of both armies were ranged side by side, having no means of carrying them to a place of greater safety. The upper gates being again made secure, a man, killed in the action of the name Philthot, and myself was posted under the archway for its defense. The enemy's artillery still continuing their fire. At length, a round shot burst them open. Stumps intended for firewood laying within were speedily scattered in all directions, the enemy not having succeeded in gaining an entry. The gates were again secured, although much shattered. After this, we were posted to defend a breach made in the wall of the building, it being upstairs and above the gateway, the shattered fragments of the wall being mixed up with the bodies of our dead countrymen, who were cut down whilst defending their post, being at this time under the command of Captain Ellington of my com company. I was then posted with the projection portion of the ruin. On the opposite side of the breach was Sergeant Aston of my company, the late lamented quartermaster. We kept a watchful eye upon the enemy, whose attacks now become less frequent as it was drawing towards the close of the action and approach of the evening, the firing shortly after ceased, and our complete victory being announced in our little garrison. We had looked around and saw the sad havoc the enemy had made of our fortress. The fire unobstructed continued its ravages, and having been unnoticed by us in the eagerness of the conflict, destroyed many of the buildings where, in the early part of the action, many of the helpless wounded of both armies had been placed for security. On proceeding into a kind of kitchen, the wounded being arranged all around as far as possible from harm's way, there is a great admixture of different countries, and from this time some Belgian soldiers with others who were looked out for their wounded or missing comrades on seeing Frenchmen among the rest begin to menace the poor fellows with their bayonets, and would have acted violently towards them if we had not had interfered on their behalf. On again going into the cart yard, it, began, it being evening, and perceiving a clear glowing fire rising from the ruins of a stable or some other outhouse, I took the opportunity of cooking the remaining portion of pork, which I had stored away in my haversack, as being stated, and having placed it upon the fire and quietly awaiting it be cooked, discovered that the glow of the fire arose from the half-consumed body of some party who had fallen in the contest. My meat, which was unsavory in the morning, became much more so by its redressing, having now found a little veal in a cooking pot hanging over a small fire, smothered with dust and fragments of the broken ruins, but sufficiently cooked. I most gladly partook of it. I have no recollection of our having any other refreshment, either on that or the previous day, 
with the exception of our ration of liquor, was in the clover field, and a small quantity of bread we found at the Cordobras among the slain. The evening now closed upon us, and we were ordered to take a supply of fuel and to proceed up the hill in the rear of the farm, agreeably to our own instructions, myself with a man named Brooker, who was blinded and by an explosion of gunpowder. Proceeded together in the direction we were ordered, and upon arriving at the bank, being heavily loaded and nearly exhausted, we had very great difficulty in passing over it. On proceeding some short distance further, found our company, and were in time to answer our names in the evening roll call. The sound of firing from the Prussians pursuing the retiring enemy now became fainter and gradually became inaudible as they distanced us. When they lay on the ground in our blankets, and we had a refreshing night's rest until daylight the following morning, when we were aroused by the accidental discharge of a musket, and in sitting posture I contemplated for some minutes on the scene before me. Being on a hill, we had an extensive view of the field of action, a just description of which would baffle the skill of the cleverest writer or the most proficient artist. Having now with others received orders to accompany a corporal to the burning remains of Hougamont, which we found to be a more complete picture of destruction than we could have anticipated, the fire having continued its ravages during the night. Here we saw numbers of soldiers of different regiments, all surrounding the only well of water known to us on the premises, eagerly striving to attain a drink of it, which had by the time become a mere puddle, and seeing no chance of attaining any, we separated in the yard. I proceeded up the yard where, on the heaps of ruins, lay the body of a comrade of Coldstreams, from whose mess tin I took some biscuit, and, turning to my left, entered the large garden, where I partook of some unripe fruit from a tree by the wall. On proceeding up the shaded avenue or garden walk by the dead body of a Frenchman, I, small, I found a small portion of butter in a single stick basket, which I have power can take up with my biscuit, and being refreshed, returned again to the yard, and on my way was met by a large pig from the same direction. There immediately appeared in pursuit several English shoulders of different regiments, one of whom fired his musket and shot the pig whilst passing me, and each one in pursuit claimed a share which I had left them to decide. Having again joined the remainder of my party, we proceeded up the wood some distance, which was thickly, thickly strewn with the bodies of the slain, many of our comrades being of the number. The heaps of the enemy slain laying about the exterior of the farm showed the deadly effect of our fire from within, and on passing near to the site of the circular attack as stated before, I found that it had been totally destroyed by the enemy's fire, and that also many of our comrades had fallen near the spot, and apparently entire, but on touching them, found them completely dried up by the heat. On passing down by the side of the garden we first entered, Amongst the numerous bodies of the slain was a wounded Frenchman in a sitting position, having no doubt fallen on the spot the previous evening, but unable to rise, we offered him our assistance, which he refused, and leaving him to his fate, we returned up the hill to our company and soon equipped ourselves, and marching down the hill, we passed a numerous group of our wounded, who had been placed together in a circular space for the convenience of medical attendance and conveyance to a hospital. Where they proceeded on our march, and having arrived at a small grass field in the side of Nivelle, we halted for the night, and boy avanced in the same, near to which was a rivulet in which we cleansed ourselves from our uncomfortable state, caused by the excessive perspiration, marching through the clouds of dust bespattered with dirt, laying on the wet ground by night, binding off the ends of cartridges, and being for many hours warmly engaged amongst burning fragments of the destruction of the Chateau of Hougamont. Now come in the time for the dis distribution of rations, camp kettles all in requisition, and a general cooking along the hedgerows. The issue of rations, liquor, and the buzz of congratulations interchanges taken place with men of different companies with their townsmen and old acquaintances sitting or reclining on the ground, each listening to the narrative of his comrade, having been separated from each other during the contest. Having any of our inquired friends in England been present in this said field of which we by Vox, we they would listen to the deepest interest to the tales that were told on the night of the 19th of June, 1815. P.S. It should be remembered that a very considerable number of the British force engaged in this memorable occasion were volunteers from the militia of the United Kingdom, more especially in the year 1813, at which period their services were more required. So their crews, with others who had served in various periods in the military, 
were in the space of a few weeks after joining their respective regiments in warm contest with the enemy.